The Rome of Tosca is enclosed in a neat isosceles triangle, whose narrow base is a line between the church of Sant'Andrea della Valle and the Palazzo Farnese, and whose apex is the Castel Sant'Angelo. The triangle lies between the Crook in the Tiber and the Piazza Navona, and we walked in half an hour, leaving time for an espresso. Sant'Andrea della Valle. This great church at the southern end of what's now the Corso del Rinascimento is crowned by the second large Roman dome after St. Peter's. It was begun in 1591 by Fra Francesco Grimaldi and completed by Carlo Maderno. The facade's a marvellous piece of flamboyant Baroque dating from 1665, designed by Carlo Rainaldi. Inside, the impressions of golden light pouring through the high windows onto a gilt interior, airy and spacious with a high barrel vaulted nave. Behind the altar, an apse closes the end of the church, decorated by Domenichino, who was said to have tried to kill his rival, Giovanni Lanfranco, for the permission to fresco the church. Lanfranco survived to paint an extravagant glory of paradise inside the dome. There is no Atavanti chapel. This was one of Victorian Sardou's inventions, and you'd look in vain for a Mary Magdalene by Cavaradossi. However, there are several noteworthy chapels, enclosed by gilded gates and railings. The first on the south side by Carlo Fantana, with green marble columns, and the second, the Cappella Strozzi, designed in the style of Michelangelo with reproductions of several of his statues. The chapels on the north side contain frescoes by Passignano, altarpieces by Giovanni di Vecchi and Francesco Manno, and sculptures by Cristoforo Stati and Pietro Bernini. There's no particular candidate for the statue of the Madonna, at whose feet Angelotti finds the key to the chapel, or for the gigantic crucifix so shown on our Tosca set. You, like the set designer Ashley Martin Davis, will just have to use your imagination. Palazzo Farnese. The home of the French Embassy since 1635, the Palazzo Farnese is unfortunately not open to the public, unless you happen to be French and in need of a new passport. A previous written application may secure an appointment for a visit. The palazzo is known as Il Dado, the Die, from its cubic form and mon monumental solidity. Its facade by Antonio di San Gallo with a cornice and central window by Michelangelo dominates the Piazza Farnese. The whole building gives an impression of imposing power and political might, appropriate in the temporary residence of Baron Scarpia. The Palazzo Farnese was begun in 1517 for Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, who became Pope Paul III in 1534. The Farnese family were not Roman at all, but Parmigiani, rulers of the Duchy of Parma from 1545 to 1731. They owned land across the Tiber in Trastevere, where the Villa Farnesina alla Lungara still stands. The original plan was for a bridge to be built across the Tiber, connecting the gardens at the rear of the palazzo with the Trastevere home, but only one arch was built. The palazzo was completed in 1589 by Giacomo della Porta. The inner courtyard where Tosca performs off stage to the Queen of Naples and her court is square, arcaded with five arches to a side. The ground floor is austerely pilastered in the Doric style, with a cornice of metopes and triglyphs, on the Ionic first floor, swags alternate with masks and roundels with the Farnese lilies. Whereas the two lower stories were designed by San Gallo, the Corinthian upper story is by Michelangelo. Inside, where opera goers might expect to find Baron Scarpia's apartment, complete with ensuite torture chamber, there are magnificently decorated halls, reception rooms, salons, and, in, and the vaulted gallery with its frescoes by Anabile Caracci showing scenes from Greek mythology above walls of gilded stucco framing more frescoes and statues. In other rooms, the door cases and fireplaces are made of figured marble, while the friezes display more stucco relief work on any spare wall space not already made over to frescoes. Along with the Borghese Cembalo, the grand staircase at Palazzo Ruspoli and the great doorway of the Shara Colonna, the Dado has always been judged one of the four marvels of Renaissance Rome. Today, restored to its former glory and used for the purpose it has served for the past four centuries, it's as splendid as ever. Castel Sant'Angelo. 
The last great monument celebrated in Tosca is the former mausoleum of the Emperor Hadrian, converted into a papal fortress and later used as a military prison. Hadrian began work on a mausoleum for his family in AD 130, and after his death it was completed in AD 139 by Antoninus Pius. At that time, it was an enormous conical structure standing on a colonnaded drum. A great spiral ramp, still in use, led up through the inside of the mausoleum to the chamber where the funeral urns of Hadrian's family were housed. In AD 271, the mausoleum was fortified and incorporated into the Aurelian Wall as part of Rome's defences. In AD 590, the Archangel Michael made an appearance above the castle, giving it its present name and inspiring the huge statue which the Flemish sculptor Peter Verschaffelt raised on the parapet. The castle was modified again by Pope Boniface IX in 1390 and linked to the Vatican in 1493 by Alexander VI, who also drove a staircase through the width of the entire building, destroying some of the earlier Roman structures. In 1527, the castle stood up to the assault by Charles V and the imperial forces during the sack of Rome. Fifteen years later, Pope Paul III built a set of fine apartments surrounding a grand reception room, the Sala Paolina, frescoed by Perin di Vaga and Pellegrino Tibaldi in a style which gives the illusion of courtiers coming and going through the painted doors. Further fortifications were built in 1557, but from that time on the castle had few modifications only changing its use with the collapse of the Pope's temporal power at the unification of Italy, when it became a barracks and a military prison. Nowadays, the Castel Sant'Angelo is one of Rome's greatest tourist attractions. The panorama from the tower gives the best view of St. Peter's and a 360-degree prospect of the entire city. Anyone attempting to imitate Tosca's leap from the battlements, however, would find that, yet again, Sardou's imagination stepped in the way of topographical realism. It's impossible to get a clear drop of more than a dozen feet or so, unless you jump from just over the front door, and the jump in the recent filmed production was quite simply faked. But we must thank Sardou for prompting Puccini to create, at the top of the castle, not only one of the great moments of musical melodrama, but also one of the greatest musical vistas of any opera, sunrise over the rooftops of Rome with the shepherds singing and the church bells pealing as the first rays touch the archangel's sword.